Welcome to this Asia Global podcast, brought to you by the Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong. I'm your host, Alejandro Reyes, the Institute's Director of Knowledge Dissemination. In our programs here in Hong Kong and online, and in the content that we produce, we focus on presenting Asian perspectives on global issues. This podcast is part of our Meet the Authors series, where we have a conversation with contributors to Asia Global Online and other publications of the Institute. Joining me now from across the hall here at the Asia Global Institute office in Hong Kong, we are properly socially distanced, is Dr. Kor Sui Kang. Dr. Kaur is a Malaysian physician specializing in health policies and global health with fellowships at Chatham House, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, the United Nations University International Institute for Global Health, UNUIIGH, and the Institute of Strategic and International Studies, ISIS Malaysia. Previously, he held progressively senior roles in clinical medicine, refugee and disaster relief, clinical research, and pharma anti-corruption, covering some 90 countries across Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. He holds postgraduate degrees in internal medicine from the Royal College of Physicians in London, public health from the University of California, Berkeley, and public policy from the University of Oxford. SK, welcome. Lovely to see you. Alejandro, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Great. Now, in your article on Asia Global Online, which is still trending, um, you write that while COVID-19 vaccination programs around the world are still in the early stages, it's clear that faith in the vaccines is not globally uniform. You observe that trust is a fragile commodity and vaccines have been politicized in many countries. Governments, therefore, you argue, must take building confidence seriously and deploy significant political will and skill along science, alongside science and facts to strengthen that confidence. You argue that these efforts must be pragmatic through a suite of targeted solutions, holistic with governments leading all of society approaches domestically and internationally and sustainable because vaccine confidence is always a moving goalpost. So um, SK, tell us a bit more about uh, what's going on around the world in terms of this fragile vaccine confidence. Uh, we heard, have the news uh, that came in this morning about the pause in the Johnson & Johnson one-shot vaccine uh, that was recommended, the pause that was recommended by US health authorities. And, and that surely is, is an example where a development that may be based on data, or I mean, I, as I understand it, they had six cases of blood clotting um, out of so many, many, many uh, vaccinations, but yet they recommended a pause in a abundance of caution. But that kind of news, that kind of development just serves to sort of undermine confidence. Um, what are your thoughts? Alejandro, perhaps a good place for us to begin is to um, celebrate the triumph of science that is the COVID vaccine. Uh, and then we should look at uh, the news of today and contextualize it in a broader, say longer term trajectory for where the vaccines are. Uh, and this is going to be a long term journey for us, maybe two or three years for us to truly vaccinate the entire world. So allow me to begin by uh, saying, sure. um, unpacking a little bit or exploring how these vaccines are actually representing a triumph of science. Well, firstly, um, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus or the COVID-19 virus is in the family of coronaviruses. Until today, we have not yet had a vaccine against the coronavirus, even though we had SARS in 2003 and MERS in 2014. And yet in the space of one year, 
of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've managed to have um, at least 11 approved vaccines all around the world and another 200 or so under investigation. And this is truly a triumph of science. How do we get to this situation where we're able to have so many vaccines approved and so many vaccines still currently under development? It's a combination of very many factors. The first and biggest factor is probably because there's a lot of money that goes into the COVID vaccine. And when you have a lot of money that goes into the vaccine research, you have a lot more people uh, researching it, uh, competition is there, there are some market guarantees and incentives for uh, private pharmaceuticals to invest more in researching the vaccine. And that's one big reason why we've got uh, um, a suite of vaccines available today. A second reason why we've got so many vaccines available today and in a short period of time is because it was easy to get volunteers. So uh, in my article, I, I looked at the Ebola vaccine. So today we've got one vaccine, three trials uh, to approve the Ebola vaccine and recruiting only about 12,000 patients over a three year period. Mm. Whereas for COVID, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and JNJ alone recruited something like um, 100 over 1,000 um, subjects in a clinical trial for that vaccine in only six months. Why? Because there was tremendous public support for a disease and a pandemic that truly affected them. Because COVID is everywhere around the world, the whole world rose to the occasion, many people volunteered to become subjects in clinical trials, and no corners were cut doing the clinical trial research process. So that's the second big reason why we got these vaccines, because a lot of people volunteered. And maybe a third and final very big and structural reason why uh, we had so many vaccines in a short period of time was because this is a truly global problem and everybody goes to the occasion. But let's right. uh, examine, Alejandro, uh, the, the, the news that you brought up today. Um, Although we've only had the vaccines for the last, uh, say, four months or so since the first shot was given in the United Kingdom on the 8th of December, we must situate uh, the last four months in the context of two to three years. Why two to three years? Because that's likely the amount of time that the world needs to vaccinate 7.8, 7.9 billion human beings. So taken in this light, there will always be stops and starts. And it is rather unfortunate uh, that uh, there, there have been some safety signals that have been detected. The term safety signal is uh, uh, industry jargon. So whenever the blood clots are, um, have come up, um, regulatory authorities, out of an abundance of caution, for example, will seek to pause the vaccination so that more data can be collected and then examined before they restart the process. So this is quite a, um, say a routine fact of life uh, in for, for many drugs, or in fact all drugs, that needs to be paused every time a safety signal will come up. That does not mean that the benefits do not outweigh uh, the risk at the moment, um, and regulatory authorities and agencies around the world, they will have different thresholds and uh, different levels of caution and levels of risk acceptance. So there could be a situation where we see some pauses and then a restart uh, of the vaccination programs um, using specific vaccines. Alejandro, I end with, uh, with another note, if I may. Uh, in that in January this year, there was some concern about the Pfizer vaccine in Norway after several um, senior citizens in Norway passed away as a result, not as a result, but um, soon after the Pfizer vaccine. But investigations show that uh, it was disconnected, not connected to the Pfizer vaccine. And that little alarm that we had in January from the Pfizer vaccine in Norway has proven to be unfounded and the Norwegians have uh, restarted their vaccination program using the Pfizer vaccine. So taken in context of a two to three year journey, um, this is about uh, right and it shows that the system is indeed working. Interesting. Uh, indeed, here in Hong Kong, we had a pause of the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine because of uh, some packaging anomalies, right? And then that took about a week or so uh, before they resumed. Uh, and it was, you know, it, it, but it caused a stir because people, of course, um, were, were, I wouldn't say confused, but uh, um, uh, took pause because they were concerned that um, these packaging anomalies might have been more serious than, than we were told. And I think a lot of that depends on on the trust level, right, um, that uh, people have with their governments. And, and, and you talk in your article about, you know, pockets of hesitation in different parts of the world. And there are many different reasons for that. You've already mentioned some, but I'm, I'm wondering, you know, uh, what you think are the danger of these pockets of hesitation, you know, if they're not adequately addressed. 
there would be several dangers uh, from this pockets of hesitation. They could firstly expand within the countries. Uh, and I gave some examples of France, Japan, and the Philippines. So they could be pockets. And vaccine confidence is a bit of a spectrum, Alejandro. So it's difficult for any one researcher to say with absolute confidence that X percentage of the population will not take the vaccine because it's always going to be on the spectrum. Yep. Um, and on that spectrum, it could see that the spectrum increases, that the number of people who um, are vaccine hesitant increase. So that pocket could expand. The pockets could also coalesce uh, with other pockets of hesitation um, or distrust in governments as a whole, not about the vaccine, not about the science, not about the effectiveness of the vaccines, but rather distrust in governments in general. And over the last, say, five, maybe 10 years, the levels of trust in government have actually dropped. And this is visible in the OECD countries and non-OECD countries whenever people do market research. So you can see that um, if you don't trust the government itself for any number of reasons, you might not then trust the vaccines that the governments are, uh, say, pro promoting or endorsing or encouraging you to have, and you're conflating the issue. On one hand, you trust the science, but on the other hand, you don't trust government. And then the distrust in government sort of overrules your trust in science. And the third way that uh, these uh, pockets of hesitation could worsen is if they're linked to, uh, say, other pockets of hesitations in other countries. We live in a borderless world in terms of social media. And the announcements of the US FDA, for example, uh, will actually be quite powerful in spreading across borders in a very quick, uh, short and very short period of time. What I mean to say is breathless reporting from the media could actually scare people. And it's so much easier, Alejandro, to scare people than to unscare people. And the role of media, social media, and so on, including the weaponization of information, disinformation, misinformation, and fake news, makes it even more challenging for us to manage this pockets of hesitation. Those are the three ways, Alejandro, to answer your question directly. Yeah, right. How this pockets of hesitation could worsen? Now, you also talk about, I mean, you just made reference to possibly misleading or hysterical reports of adverse effect ev events related to vaccines, or that may not be related to vaccines, but happened to somebody who has just received a shot. And you, you know, and, and you also in your article, you talk about malicious state or non-state actors kind of stirring vaccine hesitancy for whatever reasons. Um, I suppose in the in the world in which we live in, the kind of, I guess, fake news world, that these are kind of inevitable problems. But uh, how, how can public health officials deal with, uh, with, with these issues, these kind of, uh, you know, false or malicious or misleading reports? That's a, a billion dollar question, shall we say, Alejandro. Yes, right. Yeah. So maybe I'll, I'll try to answer in two ways. One is, what can the profession itself do? Public health professionals, what can we do? And secondly, how should public health professionals partner non-health professionals in order to fight this problem? So within our community, we could probably consider doing a few things. Number one, clearer communication. One challenge with uh, public health professionals is that uh, they have a lot of knowledge, but uh, that knowledge uh, needs to be translated in layperson language and given uh, in a way that uh, is easily digestible and understood by the common person. So it's challenging because we have all this knowledge that we want to share and we think everybody deserves to know all this knowledge. But in reality, um, the, the average citizen actually only wants a small and usable piece of the information. So one big challenge for us is to simplify the knowledge without losing the nuance. And this is very difficult to do, obviously, but as a guiding principle, it's a very good one. The second thing that within the profession we can consider doing is to um, broaden the conversation usually we'll force on the defensive because events are always going to be faster than the professional is able to manage these events. When we're forced on the defensive, we're responding to a narrow comment without broadening the conversation. For example, Alejandro, it is not about the side effects of the vaccine only. It is about the side effects of the vaccine versus the side effects of COVID. And if there is a 1% chance of getting COVID and a 0.000 1% chance of uh, getting a side effect from the vaccine, then the, the disparity becomes stark. Unfortunately, public health professionals are very good at communicating on the 0.001%, but they forget to communicate the 1%. So I would say broaden the conversation is what the public health professional will need to do. Firstly, communicate clearer, and secondly, to broaden the conversation and not to be reactive. But it's not enough that public health professionals do better. We need um, many other people who are non-public health professionals 
And in this respect, uh, perhaps the public health professional uh, will do well to collaborate with them as much as we can uh, to be more humble and realize that uh, science alone is not going to help us uh, fight this pandemic and increase vaccine confidence. We need many other multi-sectoral and interdisciplinary people to help us communications experts, uh, we need religious scholars, uh, we need uh, influencers on social media and so on, as part of an all of society response. So here I'll make the, uh, uh, share one more guiding principle, Alejandro, to answer the question, which is we need a messenger that is trusted by the individual. Unfortunately, in today's world, there is a little bit of a drop in, say, scientific literacy, belief in science, belief in facts. There are many different versions of facts uh, around this world right now. So it's important for us, uh, the, the public health professionals, to consider that we need the messenger to be believed by the recipient. Not so much the message, but the messenger is equally important. Therefore, our partnerships and our coalitions needs to be, I, I like the term, unlikely coalitions an unlikely coalition of the willing, the able, the relevant, all coming together to improve vaccine confidence mm. because public health professionals alone will not be able to do it. Interesting, because you know, if you look at certain countries, like for example, the United States, right? You uh, certainly under the previous administration uh, of uh, President Trump, you had different messengers giving different messages and kind of confusing messages. Um, and then there was, a, a, I guess, a, a focus on, well, what does Dr. Fauci have to say? And Dr. Fauci uh, became this kind of icon, as it were, uh, of, 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 of sensible science, right? And, and then you can go to different countries, like you know, Canada has Dr. Therese Tam, and, and, and so people focus on these um, uh, public health officials, these doctors as being kind of, become, they become kind of, I, I won't say rock stars, but they become these almost oracles of, of, of the truth in terms of the, the science. Uh, but uh, are you suggesting that maybe focusing just on getting these kinds of science spokesmen may not be enough that might it might have been better if maybe they hired Tom Hanks to, to because he was, of course, one of he and his wife were among the earlier um, COVID patients to 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 be a kind of more prominent spokesperson for uh, the facts uh, with regard to COVID. That that actually might have not just impact in the United States, but potentially impact in around across the world because everybody loves Tom Hanks, right? So. Alejandro, um, you hit upon a, a fantastic point, you know, um, and as I reflect on this, uh, maybe on a more sociological perspective, and I'm not a sociologist, or so just as an armchair sociologist, right. I might say, um, this focus on individuals to save us, like a Dr. Fauci, for example, to save us, uh, is a, probably a very human tendency, that we're looking for individual heroes to come in, and the, the westerns of the 1960s and 70s, those movies and the Avenger movies of the 2000s, right, are all about one single superhero or a team of superheroes coming over to, to save the world. When in fact, we need a system probably and multi-stakeholders doing unglamorous, patient communication work on the even sometimes individual one-by-one -one basis in order to increase vaccine confidence. Uh, so I, I maybe share that, uh, say, observation. But to go back to Tom Hanks, right, yeah, I think getting Tom Hanks would be, would be helpful. Um, that there would be, say, one challenge, though. The challenge is uh, we probably need a, month, a group of, uh, say, uh, people to appeal to different demographics. So we need religious leaders. Uh, and in many cases, uh, in, some, in Malaysia, for example, we've got uh, religious leaders coming in from the uh, Muslim community. Right. And uh, they've issued, this is the month of Ramadan right now. It started yesterday. So they started issuing... Um, various uh, religious ethics and uh, religious guidance that does not prohibit vaccinations during the month of Ramadan. And in fact, uh, it says that uh, your fast is not cancelled and we encourage you to uh, get vaccinated even during the month of Ramadan. And these are examples of other people who can be brought in, famous actors, sports personalities, uh, famous chefs even, because food is very dear to right. us, uh, community leaders, religious leaders. I think right. it takes a village really, um, to, to increase vaccine confidence for the whole global village. In fact, you make this point, uh, you, you, you mentioned Lagos, Nigeria, I believe, and the migrant communities in Malaysia yeah. and, um, and church leaders in the African-American communities in the United States as 
kind of examples of where you have these aren't Tom Hanks's of the world. These are just people who are trusted within their communities to get the message out. And that that really is kind of the, the, probably the most effective way of getting kind of on the ground um, uh, confidence built up. Mm. This is so true, um, Alejandro. And um, to return a little bit to the sociology theme, uh, again, not a sociologist, uh, but an armchair observer, uh, because you probably need some knowledge of societies and human psychology in order to run effective public health programs. Human beings and human societies today are probably in an age of intimacy. We trust what our friends tell us much more than a random stranger coming on television telling us that a vaccine is good for us. In the same way that we trust our friends' recommendations every time we were to go to a barber, choose a hairdresser, go to a restaurant, take a coffee. We trust our friends and family and people who are familiar and intimate with us, um, much more so than we trust a stranger, such as the world uh, today that we are in the age of intimacy and familiarity. And when you have uh, situations like Lagos in Nigeria, that just a few years ago, there was actually a very quite nasty rumor that um, um, the polio vaccine was actually used to sterilize women in, in Nigeria. To overcome that rumor, um, they, they can't trust some person from a foreign country telling them that the polio vaccine is going to be useful. They will only trust people in the community who tells them and, and live in the community right next to them. Similar to migrant worker leaders in Malaysia as well, that uh, whenever a government official were to come in and say on television or on Facebook to say that migrant workers would be given a vaccine for free, this is a government policy, but the migrant workers, uh, especially the undocumented ones, will trust their leaders much more so than a nameless and faceless bureaucrat. And finally, the African-American community in America, historically, they have had, uh, say, a worse health outcomes uh, and partially due to racism and structural discrimination. And they might trust somebody in their community, in their churches, for example, more so than they trust any person who parachutes in on a day visit just to tell them about the importance of vaccines and then goes on to the next district because this is the person's job. So the intimacy and the familiarity, I think, be very helpful in vaccine confidence. Interesting. Now, you also talk about the politicization of vaccines and how that's uh, happened in, in really many, many countries. And, and intertwined in that to some extent is the, is the development of this of vaccine diplomacy, right? So there's the geopolit geopolitics that's kind of overlaid in it. There's also some domestic po po uh, political issues. And, and, and certainly this gets wrapped up, say, in a country like the United States where um, the trust in the science and the willingness to get vaccinated has been wrapped up in the question of whether you wear mask or you don't wear mask, whether you social distance or you don't social distance. Um, I'm wondering if you'd talk a bit about that because um, of course, different countries are different situations, but how do, how do you deal, again, this is probably another one of those million dollar questions, right? How do you deal with that kind of politicization because unwinding it uh, can be very difficult, difficult as we've seen in the United States, unwinding the kind of red blue state approach to, to public health and to the pandemic has been intriguing and perplexing to, uh, to a large extent for those of us here in this part of the world and we where, where maybe in certain cases we're, we're all very, quite willing to wear masks, say, and that, uh, but yet we're, we haven't been immune to the politicization of the, of the vaccines. Alejandro, um, I, I love it that in this conversation, you and I are collecting billion dollar questions. Uh, and right. <laughs> yeah, um, so perhaps to answer this question about the, the politicization of the vaccine, uh, it would be helpful to look at it firstly at the domestic level and, and then look at it at the international level. Right. And of course, uh, um, I, I can't speak for all the countries in the world because I simply don't have that knowledge, but some trends will come out at the domestic level. And one of those trends is uh, governments over-promising the benefits of the vaccine. It's always going to be a fine line, right? Uh, governments will say uh, they want to increase the vaccination rates and then they'll say things like the, the vaccine is effective and if you take it, we can resume domestic travel. When you overpromise, uh, there is always the risk that uh, the citizens will stop trusting you if you can't deliver. And it's one example, small example of good intentions leading to poor outcomes as a result of overpromising the benefits. And it's also an example of politicization. 
if we look at a say, say more human society level, it's quite unfortunate that politicization of vaccines or face masks and so on um, are happening during this pandemic. But when you look at it in a different way and uh, through the lenses of uh, the politicization of everything, that everything's an identity uh, battle and uh, everything you do or say or wear or, or even believe um, is a form of expression of your own identity, then it's less surprising. Um, it's still disappointing though, because facts don't really care about your political affiliations or ideologies or feelings. Facts are facts. And vaccine facts are that the vaccines will protect you, face masks will protect you. So there really should not be anything ideological in this. In this particular respect, scientists and uh, say uh, clinicians are like doctors and public health physicians, we find it a bit difficult to navigate because we're trained in the hard empiricism of science that facts are facts and uh, we don't care what the ideology or the political orientations might be. Right. And we're trying to communicate the facts up to the population as rationally as possible uh, in a world that's increasingly, shall we say, polarized and fragmented. So those are my observations about the domestic side of things. Uh, on the international side, uh, Alejandro, about the um, geopoliticization of vaccines, it's almost also um, unsurprising, inevitable, although remaining very disappointing. And here we, we look at the super, um, through the lens of superpower rivalry uh, between the US and China. They might, uh, I might even make a prediction, and the prediction is uh, vaccines uh, will become a proxy for geopolitical rivalry because the more uh, the world uses your vaccines, the more prestigious uh, your sciences and your diplomacies and your stature is, leaving aside the commercial advantages and the fact that you may or may not be donating the vaccines. Just the prestige side uh, is a form of the world recognizing that uh, you are superior civilizationally or ideologically or technologically speaking. So seeing this light um, vaccines is unfortunately um, held hostage and maybe made a proxy for geopolitics. Is there a way out of this? Um, probably there are some, uh, but it requires some quite systemic work uh, by, by clinicians and public health professionals. And I'll offer some broad strategies. The first one is science has to organize. Clinicians, doctors, healthcare professionals, scientists, we have to organize because our work is being weaponized against us and weaponized against our will. And if we can mobilize and organize ourselves, not to become a political party, that's not what I mean, but to organize ourselves so that the work that we do is insulated from inappropriate politicization. And I think right. this is one crucial step globally and also at the nation state level at every country. I think this is one important way. The second way is for um, clinicians, public health professionals, doctors, and so on, to try to get into the media as quickly, as, as much as possible, not as quickly, but as much as possible and as effectively as possible to capture the court of public opinion. And if we can shape the public narrative at the nation state level, sorry, at the country level, and also then at the global level, we'll be able to do our profession a great service and also to try to avoid any efforts to politicize uh, the vaccine, either the domestic or the global level. So we've got to mobilize and we have to try to capture the public narrative as much as we can. Interesting. Now, um, can I just sort of take a, a slight um, tangent and uh, talk a bit about, because you, you were emphasizing sort of mobilization of scientists, in other words, to, to, to carry the messages forward. One area that I found possibly deficient in, I think, in the whole campaign to get people to understand some of these vaccines, as we know, there's some quote unquote new technology involved with some of them, like the Pfizer BioNTech, um, the mRNA uh, kind of technology. And when people hear about this, oh gosh, uh, you're going to affect my DNA, you're going to change me, I'm going to turn into some kind of mutant or there's some kind of X-Men kind of thing going on there. Um, and I've heard this quite a lot from friends. Oh, I don't, you know, certain recalcitrants, and, and you know who you are, um, the, the, that are not willing to do the Pfizer, say, because here in Hong Kong, uh, in large part because um, they're not, they don't know anything really about mRNA. And I, so, from my perspective, I feel that's really a bit of deficiency in the communications, trying to explain that. Yes, while it may be new in terms of vaccines, this technology has actually been around for a fair bit. 
and uh, and it's not like it's going to turn people into the the Incredible Hulk or or, or the negative of the Incredible Hulk. And uh, you're um, quite right to to bring this up. You know, um, rumors unfortunately has been proven to, uh, they travel six times faster than facts and truth uh, on social media. And all it needs to to take a, uh, all it takes rather is just one person spreading this one tweet or a post on Facebook and it goes up viral and, and now everybody um, believes in it. It's very difficult to make them disbelieve in it. Um, maybe I'll um, unpack the science a little bit as well uh, by saying that the mRNA vaccine has got nothing to do with the DNA. So it will not change your DNA, it will not alter your DNA. In fact, the mRNA vaccines are also quite, uh, shall we say, unstable. And the reason why they are unstable uh, is demonstrated sorry, the, their instability rather, is demonstrated in the fact that they need a temperature of minus 70 Celsius to keep them stable. And that's how unstable they are. But once we thaw it and deliver it to you, uh, it exists in the body for a fraction, um, fractions of time, really, does its job, and then it disappears from your body, giving you quite lasting protection. It's been proven to be at least uh, six to nine, maybe even six to 12 months already of protection after you get the second dose of the Pfizer, or sorry, any mRNA vaccine. I'm indifferent to any one of them. Um, and that's been proven already. So a very unstable vi uh, vaccine is injected into your body, does its job, disappears, and gives you lasting protection for at least six to 12 months. And I think that's a triumph of science. If we also look at, uh, um, say, in the grand horizons or, or a long panorama of time, um, there were some, the Pfizer vaccine was the first vaccine to be used in a, a global or mass vaccination program. And at that time, when it was started to be used in uh, December last year, there were a lot of concerns about long-term safety, uh, whether or not uh, it changes with DNA and so on. And one by one, they have been debunked. And at that time, uh, an interesting observation is the following. At that time, the concern was that uh, there was no long-term safety data for Pfizer. Uh, and people, some, some people preferred the older technology of inactivated vaccines or viral vector vaccines. But today, fast forward just four months into the future, we're in April, and a lot more people are confident in the mRNA vaccines and less confident in the inactivated vector vaccines uh, or the viral vector vaccines like AstraZeneca or JNG or even the Chinese vaccines like Sinovac. So the point I'm making is in the grand sweep of time on the panorama of two to three years, we will see cycles up and down where um, there would be, um, say, shifts in beliefs, uh, but over time, hopefully they will stabilize on some sort of, uh, uh, say, consensus, say in about, say, hopefully four months time or six months time, we'll have a lot more data already today. We have about uh, 600, maybe even 800 million people already vaccinated, I correct myself, 800 million people already receiving at least one dose of the vaccine. And with more data, we will hopefully stabilize at some sort of a consensus. Actually, we, maybe we, for full disclosure, we should reveal our vaccination status. So I received my second dose of uh, Pfizer BioNTech, and I believe that you are about to have your first dose. Uh, 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 and I don't know what you've chosen. You don't have to reveal, but uh, <laughs> but but that brings me uh, back to this. Uh, and you've mentioned Sinovac. And I don't mean to put you on the spot, but um, here in Hong Kong, of course, the politicization is all wrapped up in the Hong Kong mainland dynamic. And the choice at the moment that we've got is from Pfizer-BioNTech and then the Sy Sinovac uh, vaccine. And so there, are, I wouldn't say there are yellow clinics and blue clinics, but, but I mean, uh, there are those who feel a patriotic duty possibly to, to uh, have the Sinovac and there are those who never ever would I touch a Sinovac vaccine or whatever. And, and so I'm wondering if you, if you had any insights into that kind of politicization, which is kind of, I guess, unique to Hong Kong. Um, Alejandro, firstly, I'll disclose that uh, I have chosen to uh, to receive the uh, Pfizer BioNTech or Fosun BioNTech one um, because it was mostly what was the, the choice that was given to me, and I'll be receiving in about five days' time. Uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased with that. Um, to 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 come back to the to the question about insights about uh, say the politicization or even uh, the uh, entry of ideology uh, into vaccine choice, it is quite unfortunate. Um, when I 
made the decision uh, with my wife uh, to decide which vaccine to take. Political and ideological considerations never came in. And we instead decided on criteria like uh, uh, what does the data show us and uh, what, what were the choices available given the appointment times and the distance from, um, say, our place at the vaccination center. And we were also curious uh, as to the, um, the experience uh, with, uh, for example, the Pfizer vaccine, which um, is currently the leading vaccine in terms of the number of people who've been vaccinated. So you see, none of these criteria are ideological or political. So it would, uh, if I may make a, um, um, say, a suggestion to people and, and to encourage people to consider that whenever we're making a decision about which vaccine to take, uh, we can um, leave the ideology aside or the politics aside and we can just examine the facts as neutrally as we can. And this is probably one of the areas in our life uh, that uh, politics and ideology shouldn't have to come in. Um, I mean, in everything else, I mean, I'm not a, say, a permanent resident of Hong Kong or a citizen of Hong Kong, so I, I don't presume to be commenting on domestic politics. Uh, but at almost any other area, you, I, I suppose we can talk about politics, but when it comes to science and public health, we should allow ourselves, or rather we should uh, try to be guided by as much of the science and the facts as much as we can. Interesting. Now, um, another issue, other, other issues that you bring up, which I, I find really fascinating is, of course, vaccines writ large in general. In some ways, you talk about, you know, victims of their own success because do people even remember the effectiveness of the smallpox vaccine, the polio vaccine, the measles vaccine? People have forgotten how important vaccines have been in preventing and even eradicating um, those diseases. Um, so there's, you know, the, in some ways it's given way to, or given more space for the anti-vax uh, community, if I call it that, uh, to, to lay out their arguments. And, uh, and the other issue that I think is, is also fascinating is that in, and this really pertains to this part of the world, you know, countries that have been successful in fighting COVID, such as say Thailand and Vietnam, they've, they've, they've instilled confidence in the populations that, hey, if I get COVID, I'll, be, I'll receive great treatment and I'll be fine. So that that makes them less likely or, 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 or lowers their interest in getting the jabs, right? And, and I find this fascinating because in some ways it's, um, it's hard to blame folks for being somewhat complacent or lackadaisical, or one better word, on in terms of the vaccines and in terms of, yeah, I mean, they're, they're so trusting of, of their healthcare systems that it convinces them that they don't need to get vaccinated. Uh, so that's so true. Um, I, I'm fond of this uh, line, you know. Uh, if you do your job right, no one's sure if you've ever done anything at all. And that's the problem with vaccines. They've done their job so well in the last several decades that we don't, we, we don't see smallpox anymore, zero. Uh, we hardly see polio anymore, except in two or three or maybe four countries around the world. Uh, and we hardly see any number of diseases as well. Uh, there were all, we call them vaccine-preventable diseases. There are about uh, 15, 6, 17 or so vaccines uh, uh, that have pre uh, are able to prevent diseases like diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, and so on. I mean, these are all terms that we only see in textbooks because vaccines have been so successful, human beings have forgotten that we don't have these diseases because of vaccines. And therefore, it gives a lot of space, like you mentioned, for anti-vaxxers and people to, to create a lot of doubt and hesitance uh, in, in terms of uh, taking the vaccine, simply because we don't have the, the challenge of managing these diseases anymore. The second thing uh, about the complacency of it, right? So the first one is about the invisibility of the vaccine's effects and how we don't attribute the lack of problems to the vaccines. And then the second problem is that we're complacent, especially for countries, uh, uh, even, even large countries like China, um, who did very well in the COVID pandemic because uh, they, they knew uh, they had a great public health apparatus. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, there were quite uh, severe lockdowns uh, that really rescued the population and prevented a large number of cases. And even large countries like China and certainly countries like Taiwan and Thailand and Vietnam are a little slower in their vaccination programs because they thought that, oh, um, we know what it takes and uh, we have responded effectively before, we can respond effectively again. And so the complacency is not only at the citizen level, it could also be at the government level. 
And I think uh, many of these countries are really realizing uh, rather late, but not too late, fortunately, that their vaccination programs are need to pick up. And I think these countries uh, have um, made up some lost ground as well in terms of their perhaps earlier complacency. And that complacency, as you rightly described, um, Alejandro is also present at the citizen level. Um, we believe, or citizens believe that, hey, I never suffered the brunt of cases, therefore we don't need vaccines because we can control the pandemic even without a vaccine. Uh, and, and that gives a false sense of security. Interesting. Now, um, uh, another uh, tangent, uh, low-income countries or developing economies um, that don't have their own vaccine uh, production and really have to rely on, in some ways, the generosity of wealthier countries or producer countries. Um, there is this COVAX uh, mechanism that was that's being coordinated by the uh, World Health Organization. Um, what's your assessment of that mechanism as, you know, in terms of its effectiveness in being able to deliver vaccines to poorer countries uh, in the world? Um, it strikes me, and this seems to be the general observation, is that the global response uh, to the pandemic has really been rather poor. And uh, this could this be an example, as in some countries where the response to the pandemic was poor, but then the vaccine rollouts have done pretty well. Uh, could we see the, this particular rollout, the COVAX uh, program, as possibly redeeming um, global cooperation? Right. Alejandro, I'm a little pessimistic about COVAX um, for several reasons. Number one, it was set up uh, in, the, um, in April 2020 uh, together with uh, Gavi, CEPI, uh, and, and as well as uh, the World Health Organization. Uh, yeah, can you explain CEPI to our listeners? Because of course. Uh, that, that's very uh, interesting organization. Sure. Uh, CEPI uh, or CEPI is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. Uh, it is structured as a bit of a global nonprofit uh, with money from philanthropists and foundations such as the Gates Foundation. The idea behind CEPI was to accelerate the research and also the production and distribution of vaccines and any epidemic uh, innovations such as vaccines or tests. Um, the test, for example, to detect a vaccine and also medicines uh, for the pandemic uh, if the world does have a pandemic. So the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations is one of several entities that are operating something called the ACTA or the Access to COVID Pools Accelerator. That accelerator is governed by these three entities, the World Health Organization, Gavi and SAPI, and the, these three organizations um, oversee four branches in the, the ACTA, or the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator. The first one is vaccines. The second one is diagnostic kits to, to see if you don't have or have COVID. And then the third one uh, is medicines for COVID and fourth, or coronavirus, sorry. And then uh, the fourth one would be a health systems connector so that all these three innovations can be connected into the health system. It's not enough that you have the science and you have the product, you have to deliver it into the health system. So that's what SAPI is, and that's what the uh, ACT accelerator is. And the final one is about GABI, or these days it's called GABI, the Vaccine Alliance. Uh, previously, it was called uh, the Global Alliance for Vaccination and Immunization. Um, and this was set up about, uh, I, I want to say about 20 years ago, approximately, as one of the flagship public-private partnerships between the World Health Organization and non-government entities. Right. Yep. Interesting. Uh, so you, 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 you're, you're a little bit, concerned about how effective COVAX is going to be in the end. Yes, um, I'm a little pessimistic, but I will, I'm rooting for its success. Uh, so right. there is that dichotomy in my head. Um, I want it to be successful, but I'm not sure that it will truly be successful. Um, my first analysis about COVAX uh, is that it's one arm of the ACT accelerator. COVAX is a vaccine arm of the ACT accelerator. The, the challenge with the COVAX facility is that firstly it's underfunded. Um, I mean, the entire ACT accelerator is underfunded. Secondly, um, we have seen at the moment uh, that there is a lot of vaccine nationalism that rich countries, they will give a bit of money to COVAX in the region of um, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, but they reserve billions of dollars to purchase vaccines for their own citizens. I can't blame them, and I don't think the world can blame them because the world is organized as a collection of nation states. 
uh, that uh, have a responsibility, both moral and legal and political, to their citizens, taxpayers and voters. So COVAX is underfunded. Secondly, it's coming up against vaccine nationalism. Thirdly, it's also coming up against a backdrop of decreasing global collaboration. There is a lot of globalization happening, especially since the end of the Cold War. But in some ways, um, the world's also deglobalizing, especially at the global governance level. Issues that are collective action problems like climate change or global financial crisis or antimicrobial resistance or the global fisheries, right? Uh, where we're overfishing the oceans. All these things require, um, say, a very strong United Nations General Assembly, Security Council participation, and even then we can solve issues like climate change and the nuclear right. proliferation, for example. So COVAX is a little bit of a band-aid for a very structural global health, global governance problem. And indeed, it's not anymore about nation states working with other nation states. You've got to have the stakeholder approach, right? I mean, you have to have business mm. and civil society and um, even academics and, um, and others uh, to, to participate in all of this, I, I, I think. Um, uh, you mentioned, um, again, with re relation to COVAX, I mean, I think uh, Canada is one country, I know, I mean, I, I'm Canadian, where, where it's become somewhat controversial, the whilst Canada has been buying up um, doses, it's also uh, in the COVAX program. And I think it's the, if I'm not mistaken, the only G7 country in the COVAX uh, that's receiving COVAX um, vaccines, uh, which which strikes many as as, as somewhat uh, surpri as somewhat surprising, given that Canada is a, a sort of wealthy country. But there are uh, different reasons for that. But that's created kind kind of um, uh, it brings out some of the controversies involved. Um, now, um, government efforts to deal with vaccine hesitancy, to boost vaccine confidence. In your article, you basically, you conclude that these initiatives should be pragmatic, holistic, and sustainable. And I'm wondering whether sort of briefly you can just uh, outline sort of some of the ideas that, that you have in terms of what, what you mean by that pragmatic, holistic, and sustainable. Of course, Alejandro. Um, given the complexity of vaccine landscape and the large number of countries around the world, each of them in their own specific contexts, uh, every country will have to have some guiding principles. And my proposal is uh, the following three guiding principles, and then you must adapt them to local country situations and maybe even sub-national governments uh, to different communities and different demographics, because you have to be quite tailored in your approach. The first guiding principle is for us to be pragmatic. Pragmatic in the sense that we need a set of solutions and there shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all solution. There shouldn't also be a magic solution and governments should stop looking for all of these magic single one-size-fits-all solutions. Instead, we need a series of small pragmatic solutions that are very tailored uh, to the individual community at hand. For example, uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, African-Americans uh, may need, uh, say, some support from the clergy and migrant workers may need support from the leaders, for example. Those are examples of very pragmatic, very targeted and nuanced solutions instead of a magic, single, one-size-fits-all solution. And another example about being pragmatic is not to lump um, vaccine-hesitant people into one category because it's actually very subtle. Um, they can be divided into three broad groups. The first group will be those who accept the vaccines. Second group will be those who are hesitant. And the third group will be people who are outright, um, say, anti-vaxxers. For each of these three groups, you need three separate approaches. So no blood force instruments uh, in uh, your efforts uh, to create vaccine, has, uh, vaccine confidence. So that's my first uh, guiding principle, which is to be pragmatic. The second guiding principle is to be holistic in the sense that uh, governments cannot do it alone. They simply don't have the resources, network, expertise, capital, ingenuity, ideas, imagination, and so on for them to be successful alone. Therefore, they need to lead an all of society approach. Unfortunately, the term all of society has actually been quite overused uh, as a rhetorical device and for the politicians. And this really needs to be, um, say, transferred into real life. So the, the gap between rhetoric to actual implementation has to be closer and ways that we can, say, um, manifest yeah, the reality and the rhetoric of it uh, is to, for example, partner as many people as you can to build that unlikely coalition of the 
willing, the able, and the relevant. And uh, we can go to journalists, we can have media workshops and so on, and go to the community as much as we can so that we can have as holistic a solution as possible. A paternalistic government that thinks it knows best and will tell the citizens what to do is almost doomed to failure because human agency is very important and it needs to be very sustainable. And the third and final guiding principle, if I may, is about sustainability. This one's quite short, uh, Alejandro. This uh, vaccine confidence is not some mission accomplished moment. You can't uh, unfurl a banner and say we've succeeded in raising vaccine confidence because it's very fragile, like, uh, like you've mentioned, um, and it can also disappear overnight. Plus, it's always going to be moving goalposts because the targets for vaccination will change. The vaccines itself will be subject to real-world pressures. There could be new um, vaccine variants or virus variants, etc., that will come in. Therefore, governments cannot just say, oh, we're done for the day and we'll never do any more vaccine confidence efforts. And therefore, they must be very sustainable. Those are my three guiding principles and some elaborations, Alejandro, about how we can actually apply them in real life. Interesting. And I love that you, you, you use the word paternalistic, right? And um, which, which brings up another possible billion dollar, million dollar question, uh, which relates to both the ways governments have approached the pandemic itself, but also applies to the vaccine um, efforts to uh, roll out the vaccines. Um, there is a debate, whether we like it or not, where people saying that, you know, there are differences between the way authoritarian governments, I'm, I'm switching the word from paternalistic to maybe more authoritarian, governments had dealt with the pandemic and are dealing with vaccines versus the democracies, the more uh, liberal uh, societies. Um, what are your thoughts on, on, on that debate? Because it certainly you know, cuts across what you've been advocating. You know, let's talk about science, right? Because here you're talking about, well, the application of science and policy whether it's a democracy or an authoritarian system or anywhere in between, like it or not, those systems do, or, or, or the degree in which they're one or the other does to some extent impact or affect the way uh, the pandemic response has been rolled out, the vaccines have been rolled out. What are, what are, some, what are your thoughts on, on this particular billion dollar question? <laughs> um, Alejandro, thank you. Um, well, my first thought is to say that uh, um, it will be a little um, alarmingly sort of reductionist uh, to, to say that authoritarian is good or bad, a democracy is bad or good. Um, the reason what I'm saying is because between authoritarianism and democracy on a spectrum, there are also a spectrum of uh, public health outcomes in terms of the pandemic. And you can skew the data one way or the other, however you want it. Uh, so do you want to measure, for example, uh, the, um, the severity of the pandemic in terms of the number of deaths or the number of the total number of cases? But these two uh, deaths are more final and more certain and easy to count. But the total number of cases, for example, or daily new cases or the logarithmic expansion and so on, are all dependent on the number of tests that you do, which are then in turn dependent on the policies that guides the number of tests and also the strength of the health system in the very beginning. And that is in turn dependent on, uh, for example, things like how much investments that you put into your healthcare system, which is in turn dependent on the political economy of health. So the, the, the point I'm making is to complicate the scenario actually by saying that it's, it's quite difficult to draw a, a straight line conclusion between factor A and variable A to factor B or variable B. That straight line is almost never straight because there's so many things that come in, in between. I think um, there are very, there's a great amount of interest uh, in uh, ascribing, say, um, motive and uh, say, uh, let me search for the right word, not so much motive, but uh, say benefits and advantages of a particular uh, governance system over another by pointing to the responses or the outcomes of a pandemic. Um, but in reality, uh, I, I might caution against that by saying that uh, such a conclusion is very difficult to draw. Um, an infinite number of variables are involved and sometimes we can't even rule out the factor of luck uh, and um, some for Twitter's timing and some for Twitter's policies that have, uh, have taken place, right? Um, and in that complex landscape, I think it's very difficult to draw a conclusion. That does not mean that people are not trying to study it. So I know that some of my colleagues right. are uh, interested in this in terms of political science, in terms of economics, and in terms of 
uh, public health. So they study this in their own little silos. If you can have some sort of an interdisciplinary approach for studying it, I think it would be helpful. Uh, if not to prescribe the ideal form of government, government or governance, uh, but at least to tell us uh, what is a, a, a nice and happy medium that governments should be able to he uh, heal towards or some sort of a regression to a mean or a lowest common denominator for future pandemics. We, we can get into trouble if we think about ends justify the means arguments, right? In, in some ways, I think that that's probably a place where we don't want to really go uh, at, at some point now. Um, You've been very generous with your time, um, SK. I, I, let, let me just ask you about the last bit in your piece, which I, I think is also very interesting because you, you, you stress that vaccine confidence is not the only challenge, that in many ways there are other public policy challenges that need to be addressed, like um, just you know, healthcare services, the delivery of healthcare services, uh, whether uh, the logistics are, a are an issue or the affordability of financial issues. I mean, we were just talking about um, type of government, uh, you know, fear of authorities. And you've already alluded to possibly, you know, collective action of selfish persons who might be waiting for herd immunity. Um, yeah, so talk about some of these things, because in, in all the discussion of vaccine hesitancy, we may actually miss out on some of these very sort of big challenges. Alejandro, um, you and I have uh, delved very deeply into the uh, rabbit hole of vaccine confidence, and it's an important rabbit hole for us to examine. But if we go up a little bit, and I'll take us up a little bit, and I'll keep taking us up uh, to, to as high a level as possible. We began, you and I, our conversation about vaccine confidence and vaccine hesitancy, reasons why, solutions for, what can we do, the politicization of vaccines, and so on. One step higher is to look at what are the other problems that prevents people from getting vaccines. Because if the ultimate objective is to um, raise the number of people who receive vaccines, it is not only vaccine confidence that is a hurdle. Access could be a problem. Maybe some people are technologically illiterate. They don't know how to, um, say, register on the system. Uh, maybe they, they don't have a smartphone or they, they just can't read, for example. Maybe even if they can, uh, they don't know where to go. And even if they know where to go, and most of the time, um, vaccines are free. In some countries, maybe when you have booster doses and future vaccines, uh, you will need to pay for this. Uh, and then these are all other problems that prevent people from getting vaccinated. So it could be an access problem, it could be a fear of authorities problem, it could be a financial access problem, it could be a fact that I don't care, I'm a conscientious objector problem as well, and all of these needs different solutions. So not just do we have to um, resolve the issue of vaccine confidence, taking one step up, what is the reason why you want to resolve the issue of vaccine confidence it is to get as many people vaccinated as possible. But let me go one step higher. Why do we want to get people, as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible? It is so that we can manage the pandemic. Now, the national health systems around the world could be hyper-focused on vaccinations to the detriment of two other focus areas. One is COVID care, meaning contact tracing and uh, uh, isolation policies and treatment right. for people who are in ICU. We also forget not COVID care. People give birth all the time. People have cancers all the time. Diabetes and hypertension and heart disease needs to be managed. And if we only look at vaccinations, we forget COVID. And we only look at COVID, we forget non-COVID care. And, and that's uh, us uh, taking uh, into account that uh, the pandemic, sorry, the vaccination program is one piece of the pandemic management. Let me take us to the final step and the, the, the 10,000 foot view, Alejandro, is to say that health is one component of human progress. So you can fix vaccination, uh, con vaccine confidence, you can fix vaccination policies, you can fix COVID and healthcare, but health is broader, it's, it's so broad as to be a part of a uh, human progress and development. So I posit, uh, and I would love a time in the next, say, five or 10 years where two things will happen, Alejandro, that uh, companies, when they're, whenever they're making investment decisions like pension funds and uh, the investors of the world, right, would not only look at ESG criteria, the environment, social and governance criteria when deciding where to invest, they will look at HESG, health, environment, um, social and governance criteria in deciding where to invest. BlackRock, for example, one of the world's largest asset managers, has got like 8 trillion US dollars in assets. If they include H into ESG, I think that will be a step in the right direction. And I would welcome that very much. And finally, if, if I may also welcome something to think uh, much more broadly beyond just vaccine confidence, is to include health as a metric 
to replace the GDP when measuring a nation's progress. So we're no longer looking at an economy criteria, but we're looking at health metrics. Interesting, because of course we have 17 sustainable development goals. So that already creates, uh, in many ways, a template for, for that broader kind of measure. Although the 17th is all about partnerships, of course. But um, SK, can I ask you, just get into uh, closing bits. You, you're so generous with your time. Um, I'm fascinated by the fact that you were a practitioner, a healthcare practitioner, and you now kind of switched careers to looking at the global situation and thinking about public policy issues. Uh, my deep dark secret is that I was a pre-med when I was in school in university and I was all set to go to uh, medical school. And then I decided to think about pol political science, international relations, and I kind of never went back. Um, uh, what's it like? I mean, what, what what drove you to make that shift from healthcare practitioner on the ground to looking at big picture policy issues and trying to deal with some of these sort of global challenges relating to public health? Alejandro, firstly, you would have made a great doctor, um, but I'm glad <laughs> that you're uh, doing what you're doing right now because it is a form of uh, public service. And on that note, public service can be done in different ways. Um, my Maybe I'll share two reflections over here, uh, Alejandro. Um, the first one is that public service can be done in different ways. Um, and I guess uh, in, a, in a more Asian upbringing, um, I was um, taught or socialized or brought up uh, thinking that uh, um, medicine is uh, the, the most noble of public services. It is true, it's a noble public service, but to say that it's the only way or the most noble, I think is, is a little unfair and misleading because there are very many ways uh, to contribute to public service. And I, I, that explains partially um, my moves uh, from um, clinical medicine uh, to public health and now to health policies and public policies. The, the next reason or next reflection, if I may share, is that um, I was always looking for a way to, to do a bit more than what I've done previously. Medicine's important, it's beautiful because you're helping another human being. In my search for a different way or something uh, just a little bit more, um, I chanced upon public health to improve the populations of, uh, um, say, entire countries, uh, say, one percentage point uh, at a time. And then uh, chanced upon the fact that uh, we probably need health policies that are broader than health. Because, uh, Alejandro, if, uh, I'll end with one of my favorite statements, if I may. Um, if I had an extra billion US dollars to spend in order to increase the health of a country, I would not spend it building hospitals. I would spend it eradicating poverty, improving the environment in which a person lives, and improving the environment in which a person works. These are called the social or the economic or the political determinants of health. You can have a, as many, um, say, hospitals as you want, but if the person is living in poor housing conditions, working three jobs, and living right next to a polluting factory, you will never achieve health. So with an extra billion dollars, I would resolve, or try to resolve at least, things like poverty, employment rights, labor rights, housing conditions, uh, removing lead from paint uh, in buildings and so on, uh, as opposed to building more hospitals, taking nothing away from my colleagues who are in hospitals because uh, they do a very important service to humanity. Right. Well, I, that, I mean, quite, quite interesting um, approach. And I guess to wrap up, um, just wanted to ask you personally, you recently moved uh, to Hong Kong. Um, how have you been personally coping during the pandemic? And uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, I guess we've all had time to reflect on what this experience has meant to us. Uh, what, what are your thoughts as a, as a, a, I, 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 as a thinking um, scientist, as it were? Uh, as a scientist that thinks um, uh, very broadly about some of these issues, sociological and uh, psychological, if you will. I've been fortunate, Alejandro, very fortunate that uh, my family and I have remained uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, psychologically well and healthy over a very uh, difficult year for everyone. Um, so my first feeling is of gratitude. 
uh, and I'm in Hong Kong right now to join my wife, uh, who's uh, working in Hong Kong for the last uh, 50, 60 years right now. Um, and it's been a very fun journey for us uh, to well, discover Hong Kong is one thing, but also to be together because we only recently got married. I'll share a fun story that uh, we had a three-week quarantine when we came to Hong Kong. Um, and we thought that before the quarantine that our relationship will either make or break as a result of the quarantine. Uh, and it turns out that uh, we made it very, very nicely through it. So we're enjoying each other's company right now and uh, we remain very thankful for what we have. And we're constantly searching for opportunities to give back um, as a result of our gratitude for the things that we've received. Great. Now, thank you very much, SK. You've been absolutely generous with your time. We've gone way over the time that I said we would take. Um, I commend your article to our listeners. Uh, please visit Asia Global Online, Asia Global Institute websites, to sign up for our uh, weekly newsletters and other um, email uh, messages. Uh, uh, sign up, uh, follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and uh, really, read uh, uh, SK's article and get vaccinated. You know who you are, uh, get vaccinated. So um, thanks very much, um, SK. It's uh, been wonderful uh, to meet you and to discuss this uh, very important and uh, timely topic. Uh, so thank you again. Thank you, Alejandro. <laughs>